back, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. And uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce the second speaker of today, Agnieszka Zelerowicz, who will talk about inducing schemes and their role in thermodynamics. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, so I would like to talk about my joint work with Faru Shahidi. Uh, our results are not that new. I think the paper was published in 2019, so it's not the, the newest result, but I, I thought it was very appropriate for the conference. And uh, maybe it's good to advertise our work because I didn't give that many uh, talks about what we did. So our um, our result, our paper is partially a save survey. So the idea was to uh, put together all the res uh, res known results um, that involve using uh, inducing schemes and towers. Uh, specifically, like, uh, in particular, to study uh, thermodynamic formalism. So this was our emphasis on studying thermodynamic formalism and equilibrium measures, but we go a little bit beyond that. So the idea was to put together all the known results and point out the relations uh, between the intermediate systems that are used uh, in, in, in the techniques of inducing uh, the towers uh, and also fill in the gaps. So find out what is not known and see if we can uh, say something like fill in some, some of the gaps. Uh, so this should be a rather easy talk to follow because uh, a lot of it will repeat from what already appeared in other talks and also during the mini courses. Uh, so, so we start a little bit more abstractly. Uh, so we just start from a continuous ma uh, map on a compact metric space. So we try to do the, the setup at least at first um, a little bit general, so not even a diffeomorphism, no smooth structure for now, uh, just a continuous uh, map. And then uh, we imagine that we have some inducing scheme on that map. So what is the inducing scheme? So we call it the inducing scheme of hyperbolic uh, type. I think this was uh, introduced, uh, at, at least we use uh, the setting that was, uh, that was introduced by Pessin, uh, Senti, and Zhang in their paper. Um, so we imagine that we have some inducing domain, uh, which is X tilde, which is made out of a countable collection of disjoint Borel sets J, right? So we, we take the inducing domain, or which is also will be referred to as the base of the tower. Uh, this is X tilde, is a countable union of disjoint Borel sets. And then for each of those uh, sets, we have inducing time. So we require that uh, for every set in this inducing, for every set J uh, in this inducing domain, um, the image, uh, the appropriate image uh, corresponding to this inducing time will return back to the base. Right, so this is this condition I1. Um, and then if I take all the uh, appropriate images of all the, all the sets in this uh, union, then they will cover the whole inducing domain. Um, right, so this is the first condition. And then uh, the second one, um, the second one is that, okay, so then we have, we can, once we have something like that, we can consider the induced map, which is F tilde. Uh, which is defined on the inducing domain, so only on the base. And uh, the second condition that we want is we want this inducing map uh, to be conjugate uh, to, a full, to a full shift uh, in a countable set of states. Uh, however, we can weaken this uh, condition a little bit, so we don't need to require that it's uh, conjugate to the full shift, but we require that there is some set, some uh, shift invariant subset of the full shift on which we have this conjugation. And then I'm not stating it now, but later 
I will assume that this set is in a sense big. Uh, that the complement, I think I, later I will assume that the complement of the set doesn't see any nice measures. Um, but for now, let's just say that there is some uh, subset of the full shift on which the induced map is uh, conjugate uh, to, uh, to a shift. Okay, so we have the, the important thing is that we have symbolic representation on the base of the tower. Uh, on the yeah on the base of the tower uh, right and uh, then it will be also useful for us to study uh, the tower map uh, which is defined like this uh, so the tower map what it is it's a simplified abstract model of our original map so the tower map is trying to mimic our original map uh, but it is a little bit more abstract and a, a little bit simpler in a way, right? So now uh, what we are going to do, we are going to take our inducing domain and above every set J, we, will go, we are going to stack uh, a column, a corresponding column, which is made out of copies of J and how many copies we put, exactly tau of J, right? So the tau of J is the return time so above each j, we are going to put tau of j copies of itself. And this will be our tower. And then the corresponding tower map, which I will denote by f hat, is, uh, is given by just going up by one, uh, right? So from, from point x, which was in, the, in j, to a copy of x in the, j, in, the, in the copy of j, which is above, right? So in the tower, I will just keep going up until I reach the end uh, of the column and then I go by, I, I do what uh, the induced map tell me, right? So then I go F tilde of X. And so I'm back in the base of the tower, right? So the tower map is, uh, is like an abstract model for the original map, uh, but we will, it will be later useful to, to study, uh, to study the original map, okay. So we have really three dynamic, three, three dynamical systems uh, here. And so our goal was to uh, study the relations between the three of them. Um, okay. All right, so, okay, an example, of course, uh, this is a workshop on Young's diffeomorphisms. Uh, so it should, uh, immediately look similar that this abstract setup uh, resembles a young diffeomorphism. Yes, the young diffeomorphism is definitely an example of what I just described. Um, and so, if for if we have a, if we have a young tower, then the base of the tower would be this countable horseshoe, right? So our sets J would be nice rectangles uh, whose boundaries would be stable and unstable manifolds. Um, Right, so this is, and then we would have a uh, symbolic representation, of course, because the base of the tower is a countable horseshoe. Um, right, so this we have this Markov property for the for the young uh, for the young diffeomorphisms, and this property ensures that the base has uh, symbolic representation. Okay. The, that was an example, but our setting in principle is a little is more general because we don't a priori need a smooth structure. Okay, uh, so now what uh, what I want to say is okay. So now uh, we want to study invariant measures and the relations between invariant measures for the three systems. Uh, so let's say that as a starting point, we have a measure which was invariant under the induced map. So here I will follow the convention that whenever I talk about the induced map, so the map which is on the base of the tower, I'm going to use uh, notation with a, with a wave, right? So if I have mu with the wave, it means that it's a measure which is invariant under the induced map. Uh, and if I have a hat, then it means that I'm talking about the tower. And if I have nothing that it means I'm talking about the original map. Okay, so let's say that we have a, a measure which is invariant under the uh, induced map. And 
then I integrate the return time with respect to this measure. And it is important uh, for our analysis that this integral is finite. OK, so one thing that I uh, should point out is that the induced time, we do not require that it, um, we do not require that the induced time is the first return time. This is kind of uh, important generalization that it, it doesn't have to be the first return time, which makes the analysis a little bit more complicated. On the other hand, the way we defined the tower map, uh, for the tower map, the induced map, uh, the induced time is the first return time. So that may be a little bit uh, helpful later. Okay. So anyway, uh, so yeah, so we do because we do not require that the first uh, that the return time is the first return time. Uh, we don't a priori know uh, that the induced time is integral. So we have to assume that. Okay. So we, we assume that uh, the integral of the return time uh, is finite, and if we have that then we can lift the measure from the base uh, to the original space using this formula. Uh, and we can do the same on the tower. On the tower, okay, so uh, maybe the formula itself is a little bit more complicated, but it's very easy to see what we would, what would happen on the tower, how we would extend the measure from the induced base of, uh, to the tower. We would just, because the tower is made out of copies of subsets of um, of the base, right? So we would just move the measure, uh, right? So we would take the measure restricted on J and put it in the copy of J, right? So uh, we know exactly what the measure looks like on on the tower, how we can lift it to the tower, and then you would you could see that you would get exactly the same formula if you tried to write it down. Um, okay, so we can. We have this. Now the relation, which is uh, very easy to see, is that uh, if the measure that we started with, the measure defined on the base, uh, was ergodic with respect to the induced map, then the lifted measures are also going to be ergodic. Of course, they will be invariant um, for the corresponding maps, and they will be also ergodic. Uh, but this is very easy to see. Um, there is a little bit uh, there is a little bit of risk that um, our mechanism will not uh, see all the measures uh, because for example on x not uh, not all the measures which are invariant under our original map can be obtained as a measure lifted from the base uh, in particular because um, Okay, but here this relation, which uh, which so we will only restrict our attention to, to measures which can be obtained by this procedure. So we will only consider the class of lifted measures, and those are all the measures which were lifted from the base. And um, what this class is for the original map, maybe it's not so clear. Uh, in particular, if the if the return time is not the first return time, however. Uh, for the if if I look on the tower map, because on the tower map the return time is the first return time, uh, then we can see that uh, the all the measures on the tower which were lifted from the base, those are all the measures uh, for which um, the base of the tower has positive measure. Right, so all the all the measures invariant under the tower map, which gives give positive measure to the base, uh, though all of them can be lifted from the base, and this is because the uh, on the tower the induced time is the first return time. Okay, uh, and then there is a relation. Uh, the, the the tower map and the original map though they can be related through the base, uh, right? So if we have two measures which are both lifted from the base, uh, we can relate them by, uh, so if I take, uh, if I have a measure on the origin, for the original map, which was lifted from the base, I can project it back to the base and then lift it in the tower, right? So that's how I, I, I can relate the measures on the, on the original map and on the tower. 
through this uh, projections and lifting again. So I will actually call them, uh, say that that mu is a projection of some mu hat. If I can obtain mu uh, mu hat by by doing this projecting and lifting again to the tower. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so, so okay, so nat natural question uh, to ask is, so, so since we have uh, a way of obtaining measures, invariant measures for the original map and for the tower from uh, measures on the, on the base, uh, the natural question to ask is what kind of properties will uh, also transfer from the, from the base to the tower and to original map. And also since we can relate the measures, um, the measure, the original map uh, and the tower map, they seem to be very closely related. What are uh, what are the relations? The, uh, what are the properties of the uh, measures um, on the tower and on the original map? So, like this is exactly the kind of questions that I will be asking, and we will see that beyond uh, just uh, ergodicity. So we can clearly see. Well, if we have, if we started with an invariant ergodic measure, we will obtain invariant ergodic measure if we, after lifting it. But if you ask about any other properties, turns turns out it's very difficult. So let me start with the first thing, which is the Bernoulli property. So we imagine that what we have, uh, okay. So we start with a measure which was on the base, and then we lift it. And then we lift it to the tower and to our original space. And now we are going to ask about the Bernoulli property. So the first thing is I'm going to ask if I can prove Bernoulli property for the tower map, does it imply a Bernoulli property for the original map? And this is one of the positive results uh, that, that we obtain. And I even included the proof that, because the proof is very easy. So here we can see the way that we define the, the tower map, as I said. Oh, I froze. Did I freeze? No, we can uh, we can hear you. It's fine. Okay. Um, I see my face is frozen. All right. Um, okay. So, so as I said, uh, the tower map uh, supposed to serve as an abstract model of the original map. Uh, and in fact, what we can show is that uh, our original map is isometric, uh, is isometric to a factor of the tower map. Uh, and why is it so metrically uh, isometric? Uh, so why is it not actually, uh, uh, isometric or isomorphic? I'm sorry, isomorphic. Why is it not actually isomorphic to the tower map? And uh, the reason is because on the tower map, uh, we have the first return time, which is uh, the, the first, uh, the induced time is the first return time, but it's not necessarily a case for the original map. So what can happen is that, uh, when we uh, on the tower, when we take the tower and we we stack uh, copies of uh, all, all elements of the tower one above the other, um, we always obtain disjoint images this way. But in actuality, for the original map, if we take uh, if I keep uh, iterating uh, sets J under my original map, the images may not be disjoint, right? Because the um, the induced time is not necessarily the first return time. Okay, so so the our original map and the tower are not necessarily isomorphic, but if I uh, account for this relation, um, right? So I can introduce. Uh, I can uh, I can introduce this uh, relation uh, that will say that. Uh, two pairs on the tower x, k, and y, l. I identify them 
uh, if they are actually if we have this relation that fk of x is the same as fl of y uh, on my space x, right? Uh, so if I do this identification, then I definitely have uh, isomorphism between the tower and the map after doing this uh, identification, right? So so then if uh, the tower map was uh, uh, Bernoulli, then the original space as a factor of it must also be Bernoulli because every factor of Bernoulli is Bernoulli. Um, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Because something strange is going on, I think. Uh, yeah, on, on this side, it seems everything fine, actually, although we cannot see you. Uh, we cannot uh, see you. But... Okay, let me see if maybe I can change that. But we can hear you um, fine, actually, and we can see the slides. Yeah, that's fine, perfect. Okay, I, can, I think I came back. Um, all right. Okay, so this was uh, Bernoulli property. But now also from this, you see that it's not so clear if we can have the implication the other way around, right? Because the original map is a factor of the tower. Uh, so, so that's why if the tower is Bernoulli, then original map is Bernoulli. This doesn't necessarily seem to happen the other way around, right? Okay, but this was very simple. But but now uh, what we are really interested in is uh, let's say that we have a measure uh, which was Bernoulli on the base, and now can we say that this is Bernoulli on the tower? Because this is really the direction that we are interested in when we use the methods of inducing, uh, right? We would be able to show that. Um, Yes, that the measure that on the in, on the inducing domain is Bernoulli, and can we say that it's uh, Bernoulli when we lift it? And this is much more complicated. And in general, uh, it is uh, I probably not necessarily true, uh, but we can prove that it's true if we have those two conditions B1 and B2 for the uh, for the measure. On the on the base, and those conditions uh, they look very strong, and they are probably uh, in in general very hard um, to check. Uh, but there are some situations in, in which I can imagine that they could be verified. So so the condition B one it should be rather, rather easy. It just means that the measure on the base had a product structure, and that should uh, somehow, yeah, that, that, that should follow from product structure. But condition B2 is much more uh, restrictive. But what is, uh, what's, uh, how can it be used? Well, the only advantage of this condition is that I don't have to, uh, I, can, I can stick to just analyzing the measure which was on the base, right? Um, so if, uh, if I am able to prove that the measure on the base is Bernoulli with respect to the induced map, uh, in order to show something like this, I would probably have to show condition B2 uh, with replacing F hat with F tilde, right? So if I had F, um, right? So if I had induced map, so in order to show that the uh, partition by cylinders is, uh, uh, it's weak Bernoulli, and so in order to show that the induced map is Bernoulli, I would probably need a condition like this uh, with if I replaced F hat with F tilde, right? So if I am able to show that the induced map is Bernoulli, uh, most likely I am able to show this condition for the induced map. And so our result says that if I can replace here the induced map with the tower map, but still only analyze uh, with respect to the induced measure, uh, then the tower map is Bernoulli. Um, okay, and uh, I will show later when I will move to more concrete classes of measures, uh, how this can be verified. Okay, but in general, we would have to check something like this. Okay, um, all right. Uh, now, uh, another question that one could ask is uh, what are the relations between uh, mixing rates and 
uh, maybe central limit theorem? Is it true if uh, induced map satisfies central limit theorem? Is it true for the uh, for the lifted measures as well? And those aren't our results. Uh, I mean, this proposition follows easily if we just put together uh, results of Young and one. So this is one paper which was done for I think expanding maps, and then uh, there is another paper by Melbourne Teresho that extended to um, hyperbolic maps. So if we put together those results, uh, those two papers, we obtain a result like this uh, about decay of correlations. So of course you always expect uh, when once you know uh, mixing rates for the induced map, uh, in order to say something about the, the tower map, you have to know something about the decay rate of the tail of the rate. So you have to study um, tail of the measure with respect to the induced time. Um, and that's really the only way that you can uh, claim something for the tower. But this is itself not enough. We also need to know something about the measure. The, me the measure has to have some nice properties too. Um, so the result that is known is that if we have uh, a measure which has this nice property, which is like the, the push forward Jacobian is held there continuous pretty much. This is what it says. So we have this condition for the measure uh, where the G of mu tilde is just the push forward Jacobian of the measure. Uh, so if a measure has this form, then uh, we have the following. So for the tower map, uh, we have that if the induced measure had exponential uh, has exponential tail, uh, then then the tower map has exponential decay of correlations. Um, right, and the same with polynomial. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, and about the central limit theorem, uh, we can claim central limit theorem for the for the tower map uh, for observables that have certain form that they don't go too far into too high into the tower. Um, so if they are supported kind of in this lower par portion of the tower, uh, this finite portion of the tower, then we can also show central limit theorem. All right, so this was for the tower map. And then in order to claim the same for the original map, uh, we need a little bit more. Uh, we need those two conditions, F1 and F2, uh, that pretty much, uh, F1 pretty much tells us that we have uh, contraction and expansion respectively. Uh, so here you would expect some kind of hyperbolic structure on the, um, on the base of the tower. So for example, for Young's diffeomorphism, this will be satisfied. And then there is another regularity condition F2. And so if we have those two conditions, then we have the same result for the, uh, for the original map. Okay. All right, so this is as much as we can tell in general. Uh, in order to verify those conditions and actually say something about particular measure, we need to know something about the measure. And then there is a big class of measures for which uh, those results can be established. And so now I will restrict my attention to just equilibrium measures and study equilibrium measures. Okay, uh, but for this, we also need additional conditions. Uh, so those conditions uh, we borrowed from the paper by Pessin, Senti, and Zhang. So Pessin, Senti, and Zhang, uh, they wrote a paper in which they use uh, uh, those uh, inducing schemes of hyperbolic type uh, to establish uh, existence of equilibrium measures for certain maps. And so we are exactly going to use this and then establish some more properties. Um, so what we need is, so I mentioned that at the beginning of my talk that we need on the base of the tower, uh, uh, we want the base of the tower to be pretty much conjugated to the full shift, right? So uh, I said that 
we assume that there is some set A, which is a, a shift invariant subset of the full shift on which we have the conjugation. And so now we add this condition that the set, um, that the complement of this set supports no invariant measure, which gives positive weight to any open set. So basically the idea is that because we are aiming at, uh, we, our goal is now to find uh, Gibbs measures uh, for, for the induced map. And so the idea is that no Gibbs measure can be supported on the complement of this good set A. Okay, so this is the first condition. And then we also need an existence of at least one periodic point in our inducing domain. And uh, the last one is arithmetic condition that says that uh, GCD of the inducing times is equal to one. And that will give us uh, later that the tower is uh, will be a topologically mixing uh, Markov shift. OK. All right. And so now we want to study equilibrium measures uh, again for the three uh, for the three maps. So we start with the sum potential, which is defined on the original space, and then we define two corresponding potentials, one on the tower and one on the inducing domain. Okay, so in the, on, the indu on the base, we, uh, we induce, right? So we sum up along the columns of the tower, pretty much. Um, okay, and then we study equilibrium measures, but we restrict our attention to only measures uh, which can be lifted, right? So by equilibrium measure in this setting, I will mean uh, the measure that maximizes the sum of entropy and the integral uh, in a space of all lifted measures, right? So this doesn't necessarily immediately give us equilibrium measure, but in many cases, we can show that uh, those lifted pressures uh, defined in this way, they are actually the same as topological pressures. Um, okay, so we have this. And then on the inducing domain, we actually have, uh, this will be the same as the Gurevich pressure later. Okay, uh, so this is it. Um, we should speed up. Okay, and then we have a colle uh, collection of conditions for the potential. And uh, again, though, this is just uh, the list of conditions that guarantees um, that, so, this is going to guarantee two things. It's going to guarantee that on the base of the tower, uh, where we have a symbolic representation, uh, if we study thermodynamic formalism for the induced potential, we can apply all the results of uh, that were established by Sarig. So we will have unique equilibrium measures, and they will have really nice properties. But also those conditions guarantee that we can lift those equilibrium measures to obtain equilibrium measures for the on the tower. Okay, uh, so those are conditions, and then here is the first result, which uh, it's not ours. So, um, so the result is for the induced map. So under those conditions on the induced map, we can apply results of Sarig to obtain that there exists a unique equilibrium measure, and in fact, it's a Gibbs measure for the induced potential, okay, on the base. Um, and then since it's a Gibbs measure, it's a well-known result, classical result, that this measure is going to have exponential decay of correlations uh, and satisfy central limit theorem. And also another result by Sarik is that uh, this map has Bernoulli property. So th this map, uh, uh, that this measure has Bernoulli property. So we have all the nice properties on the base. Okay. Now, in order to lift them to the tower, uh, well, here's what happens. Yes, we can lift them to the tower. Uh, so if we lift the measure under those conditions, we, we obtain uh, ergodic uh, equilibrium measure for the potential on the tower. And this is a, yeah. And now about the other properties, uh, we uh, we have that if we, this lifted measure is mixing, then it is Bernoulli. So this is the result. We would have to check mixing uh, 
independently, but if we can check that the lifted measure is mixing, then it is Bernoulli. And then uh, we have the K of correlations, um, but only uh, but only un under uh, depending on the uh, on the tail, right? So if the tail of the lifted measure decays. Uh, exponentially, then we have exponential decay of correlations. If it decays polynomially, then we have polynomial decay of correlations. Uh, and we have uh, the central limit theorem, but with this, uh, if we restrict our attention to observables that only remain in this finite part of the tower. So we have this. And then for the original map, uh, so the existence uh, of, a, of an equilibrium measure, this was uh, the main result in the paper by Pessin, Senti, and Zhang, and then we added to it several things. So, so we added the relation that uh, that the measure on the on the original map is can be obtained as by using this relation between the map and the tower, right? So all the three measures they are related in this nice way, um, and then we also have the same that if uh, if the measure is mixing, then it is Bernoulli. And under those conditions F1 and NF2 that I introduced earlier, we have the same results about decay of correlations and central limit theorem. Uh, okay, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, how we obtain Bernoulli property because this was really our main contribution uh, here. So, uh, in order to obtain Bernoulli property, we uh, we actually prove a, a more general result in symbolic setting and then extend it. So we use uh, so on the tower we can uh, we can have a symbolic uh, representation. So we uh, we define the following mark of partition of the tower, uh, which says. And let me see if I can maybe. Uh, something uh, what happened oh no i messed up everything's fine we can see you and hear you oh, okay uh, uh, yeah. no i i exited the full screen oh yeah now it should be better no i just wanted to be able to uh mark something okay uh so we have uh, Okay, so we introduce the Markov partition on the on the tower in the following way: uh, we treat the whole uh, we we treat the whole base of the tower as one element of the Markov partition, and then other elements of the Markov partitions have this form. So for k strictly positive, we take each j k. Uh, we, right, so each copy of each J as a separate element of a of a Markov partition, but then the whole base as a, as just one element of the Markov partition, and then we have uh, we obtain a countable Markov shift uh, with the following uh, allowed transitions. So from base of the tower, I can go to the copy of any J in the first level, right? So to any J, uh, but on the first level. And then from from each JK, I can go to JK plus one. And then from J, once I reach the uh, the bot the top of the tower, uh, the allowed transition is to go back to the base of the tower. Right. So we have those allowed transitions. So now this is a mark of shift. Okay. Uh, and it's topologically mixing because we have this condition condition I phi. Um, all right, so now what we are going to to do, we are going to prove, um, I mean, in this talk, I'm only going to state, but, but we prove the following result in the symbolic setting. Is that so imagine that we have a topologically mixing uh, uh, countable Markov shift and we, uh, we choose one element, uh, right? So one, uh, one letter, um, right, one state, and then we, uh, are going to consider the induced shift uh, on this um, on this one letter, okay? And uh, we assume that we have a potential which is only defined on this on this one cylinder, okay? 
uh, and uh, we assume that this potential is locally held there with respect to the induced shift. Uh -huh. Right, so we have a potential which, uh, yeah, so we assume that we have a potential which is, indu which is induced uh, on this plan element and it's locally held there um, with respect to the induced shift uh, and has finite Gurevich pressure. And so then we have unique ergodic equilibrium measure uh, for this potential and uh, we can lift this measure to the full to, to the uh, to the Markov shift the, the countable Markov shift that we started with. Uh, and then we have the following if we can prove uh, that this lifted measure is mixing, then it is Bernoulli. Okay, so this extends the result of uh, Sarik. So, so if I assumed um, that the original potential on the uh, on the original uh, countable Markov shift. Uh, was locally held there continuous, then um, it is a result of Sarik that, uh, that the equilibrium measure is uh, Bernoulli. However, so we extend it and we only, uh, so when we are on topological uh, mixing Markov shift, we now induce uh, on one element and then we assume that the induced potential is locally held there. And we can still prove that the lifted measure, uh, so I, I do all the analysis for the induced shift, and then I lift this measure and it is still going to be Bernoulli, the lifted measure. Okay, so this is, uh, this is what we prove, which I thought maybe was interesting to see. Uh, and what else? Oh, okay, we also talk about phase transitions. Um, so, uh, uh -huh. So 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 now it's separate because we no longer talk about measures. But since we we are talking about equilibrium measures, it also makes sense to talk about pressure itself. Um, so now we are going to study um, regularity of the pressure. So uh, we assume a bunch of conditions on the potentials. Now we have two potentials. Uh, the, and we require that they satisfy various conditions. And then under those conditions, uh, we can show that the pressure on the tower, uh, which is the same as the pressure for the original map, uh, is a real analytic. And so again, um, the fact that the pressure uh, for the induced potential is, uh, is really in analytic, it follows from the results uh, of Sarik. Um, and we extend it to, uh, to the tower and the original map. Um, and do I explain how I do it? I don't think I just... Oh, no, now I just apply to, okay. Um, okay, so... Uh, maybe it's worth mentioning how we can extend uh, results about the analyticity of the pressure from the induced uh, domain to the tower. Um, we do a nice trick. So, um, uh, uh, right. So, uh, so Sarik proves uh, analyticity of the pressure on a countable Markov shifts under uh, certain conditions. He proves that the Ruel operator has a spectral gap and it has all those nice properties. And uh, what we do is uh, we obtain the pressure on the tower implicitly uh, as the as the zero of a certain potential. So we would have potential. Uh, so we have an induced potential minus omega. Uh, so that the pressure is zero, right? And the and the omega will be pressure on the lifted uh, our lifted pressure. So we obtain uh, our pressure on the tower impl implicitly as a zero of a certain equation which was set up um, for the pressure on the, of the induced potential, and then uh, we obtain analyticity of our pressure using the uh, implicit function theorem. So we use this uh, kind of this using this simple trick, we can 
uh, we can obtain that. Which, by the way, reminds me of how we actually prove uh, those properties to obtain earlier the Bernoulli measure, uh, the Bernoulli property for the equilibrium measure. We also use uh, the real operator for the uh, for the for the for the induced measure uh, and verify this condition which I uh, stated earlier. Okay. Um, all right. So now just. Uh, applications of like maybe some I thought maybe it would be good to actually give some concrete example of uh, when our res uh, all results uh, play out. Uh, so let's go back to uh, Young's diffeomorphisms. So now we have nice hyperbolic structure, ni nice smooth structure, uh, diffeomorphism and nice hy with uh, some hyperbolicity. Uh, but so I I'm listing all the conditions here that I'm assuming. And so some of them are standard conditions, which are just part of the definition of a young diffeomorphism. But I also added the conditions that we need for uh, for our results to play out. So uh, I think I, I don't even remember which are which. I think, yeah, condition Y4, it doesn't always appear in the definition of a young diffeomorphism, but we need it for our results, right? So that you see this arithmetic condition. So this is the first set, but like the first two are just standard conditions for the young diffeomorphism. And uh, then we have more, right? Condition Y7 is the standard condition for the, for the distortion, but it's also usually the most difficult one to verify. Um, okay, and we also need, I think uh, it's not usually a part of the definition of a young diffeomorphism, but we have this condition Y8, which will uh, uh, help us establish the tail of the, um, yeah, the, the decay of the of the tail of the measure with respect to the inducing time. So we, we do need this condition in our setting. Uh, all right, so we have all those conditions. And then we consider a potential, which is a geometric potential. Um, and then, uh, under those conditions, um, uh, it has been verified by Pessin, Senti, and Zhang in their paper that the young diffeomorphisms admits an inducing scheme that satisfies our con uh, our conditions that abstract conditions that I introduced earlier. Uh, I two and I four, which I forgot what they are, but uh, condition I3 has to be checked independently. Condition I, I3 was to check that um, um, that the complement of uh, of the set where we have uh, conjugation to the full shift doesn't support any uh, nice measures. Um, so under this condition, we have a unique SRB. And then this condition guarantees that uh, the geometric potential satisfies the conditions that, that were needed for the uh, for the existence of equilibrium measures, uh, right? Um, okay. So what is actually the result? Uh, so this is so this is just saying that uh, the Young diffeomorphism satisfies all the conditions uh, in. That we listed earlier for our results to hold, and so what is the actually uh, the result when we put everything together? We have the following: if we have a diffeomorphism that satisfies all of the conditions that I gave for young diffeomorphism, um, and in addition, as, as satisfies this condition I three, uh, then we have uh, some interval in T. Uh, so, so we have some T0 and we have inter on the interval from T0 to 1, we have a unique equilibrium measure uh, for the geometric potential. Um, and uh, the pressure is real analytic. And then we have exponential decay of correlations and central limit theorem if we, in, uh, in addition, verify uh, this condition for, the, for our map. And we have uh, that the equilibrium measure has Bernoulli property. property. Okay, so we have all this. Um, and I think that was it. Okay.
All right, so this is all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agnieszka. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? So I have a question that I've always actually been very intrigued by this last condition you mentioned about the cardinality of the sets that have a certain return time, right? Yes, this uh, yeah. SN, yes. Uh -huh. this one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because, so what uh, do you, is it, is there a way to explain why this comes in or, or somehow what the role of this condition is? Because in some sense, the cardinality of the partition element is not necessarily an intrinsic, is not necessarily an intrinsic part of the tower, right? Because you could, yes. well, yeah, it's not clear to me what that, why that condition is used. Uh, yeah, I think this condition is supposed to use to verify uh, the condition P4 for the potential, which was, I think, the, the hardest condition to check. So let me maybe go back and see what the P4 is. So yeah, so P4 is this condition, uh, mm -hmm. this technical condition, which is, uh, if I remember uh, correctly, in the language used by Sarik, I think it's called um, positive recurrence or something more than that, strongly positive recurrence. I don't know, oh, Omri is still here. Uh, so maybe he can tell us. Uh, yeah, so this is the, condition that is usually the also I think the harder to establish the hardest to establish. Um, that, that relates to strong positive recurrence. Yeah. yeah so, sure. so this this uh, bound on the cardinality is just a sufficient condition to prove this. Yeah. Is this what I say? I say. Yeah. So there yeah. might be so so is it do you think um it is possible to relax that condition, you know, to use different ways to verify this rather than having that. Can you, can, are there examples where you do not satisfy the bound on the cardinality, but you do satisfy this condition? Uh, I don't know of any examples like that. I mean, of course, if you could verify this condition uh, independently, then, uh, then all the results should follow because I think other conditions can be verified without it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, verifying this is not easy. I mean, uh, there is another work, I think, by uh, Ben Cole, where he uh, does something, uh, I don't know which methods he uses, but he uh, obtains the whole, so we have, so we not only have that uh, we need this strange condition to verify P4, but even with this condition, uh, we only can obtain that there exists this interval from T0 uh, to one, right? And it's not clear like why this T0 appears if it's, uh, but like it appears in the estimates that we cannot do it for all the Ts like, less than one, but there is this T0, which this is where we run out of like, good estimates. Uh, but I think there is a work by Ben Cole where he uh, also studies geometric potential and he doesn't have this T0. So I think he has results for all the Ts. But I'm not sure what results, uh, what uh, methods he's using. So maybe he found like a better way. Um, but yeah, the short, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Nieska? Okay, well then let's thank both of today's speakers, Agnieszka and Omri. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the participants for being here today. It's uh, very nice to, it. I recognize the names every day. So it, it, it is a little bit of feeling of, the, uh, of a regular conference in some way of seeing the same people every day. And uh, so we will uh, be here again, as Yuri said, same time, same place tomorrow uh, 
for the last day and the last day of talks. Okay. So very best wishes for the rest of the day, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you.